I'm going to introduce our next speaker, guys. So come on in, sit down. This is next to last, and we're almost done for the night. I know it's a sad day. It's a sad time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you can join me in welcoming our next speaker. If you, anyone not get one of these things? These are great, aren't they? I mean, we just, I don't know if we have any left, but they're really awesome. I mean, my, one of my staff came up with this idea two years ago, and we've been doing this ever since. You can just, like, turn it over, and all you need is the Hubble telescope or a microscope to read it. But if you have really good eyes, it's really great. So Robert Anderson is our next speaker. He's a former intelligence officer with the U.S. Army, and um, he's been an instructor for SOCOM intelligence training. And uh, he's got some really interesting topics and a lot of experience in the topics that he's about to talk about. So the title of his talk is U.S. Interrogation Techniques and Social Engineering. So join me in walking, uh, welcoming Robert Anderson. Thank you, Chris. Really hard to follow Chris after you know, an event like this, but I appreciate it, and I'm very honored, actually, to be here in front of you, and thank you very much. I hope you find what I'm about to tell you, you know, educational, and that you'll be able to adapt and apply it, you know, in, in the course of work that you're doing right now, because I think it's very important. A little background, uh, yeah, former intelligence officer, uh, I was in the U.S. Army Interrogation School, I uh, also went through the Israeli inter interrogation school, and then after a couple years, uh, became a senior instructor for the U.S. Army for interrogation. I've conducted a bunch of missions all over. Uh, 20 years, I actually, you know, my first computer experience was an Apple II with the Army, and they had it, they had this, you know, green screen and basically connected to a uh, the 33-inch uh, disc for gathering and monitoring intelligence. And then I bought my Macintosh when they first came out. And we used you know, a lot of different computers uh, at that time. Uh, I've been in the IT cybersecurity field for you know, over 15 years. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under Elvis and my other handle is The Mantis. What I just found, you know, as I, as I became uh, more and more involved in IT and cybersecurity, and the, the whole vectors and the whole attacks coming through social engineering and, of course, trying to be a, stay up in the field as a professional, I saw just some complementary things about what I learned in interrogation school and the techniques that social engineers use, you know, in order to display their craft. It's comparable. It's congruent. It's corresponding. To me, they, they kind of share some DNA. I kind of think of them as Irish twins. There's, you know, they're not quite exactly the same, but they're close enough for you to go, you know, they must be related somehow. Uh, the interrogation school is probably some of the most comprehensive training, you know, I've ever been through. It was really, really thorough. Um, it's conducted at the uh, U.S. Intel School down in Fort Huachuca. We called it Fort We Gotcha. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of intelligence training that goes on in that, in that uh, fort. Uh, the overall interrogation program itself, let me see, I'm coming out of college. You know, my background's in uh, Near East history and languages. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I thought I was going to go to Harvard and, you know, be a, get my Ph.D. and become a professor and, you know, read Ugarit and Hebrew and Arabic all day long to people. Uh, but then this recruiter came to me and said, you know, we could really use someone like you. And I was like, how? And he started going over what they were doing and talked about the interrogation school. And I was like, well, you know, I'm really not into hurting people and bamboo shoots and, you know, all that stuff. So I'm not so cool about that. He, then he said, well, we're going to train you in Arabic and we're going to send you overseas to travel all the time. And I was like, OK, I'm into that. I want to learn another language. I love travel. The overall uh, program itself, just the interrogation trainings, uh, it used to be six months. When I went through it, it was six months. Now they've shortened it a little bit. Uh, then when I took the training, we were given a targeted language, you know, for various countries, the leading target areas, 
are pretty much the same right now. Uh, Middle East, China, and Russia. The uh, we first started out uh, doing just classic book learning and understanding the different techniques and getting tested on those. You know, every day there was a test on a certain technique and a certain approach, and so it was a lot of book learning. And then after that, uh, we had a two-hour prep, and then we were in a three-hour lab in an actual mock interrogation with a variety of different type of sources, as we call them, targets, as social en engineers call them. Everything was recorded, so my whole three-hour interrogation with anybody was always recorded. And then we'd go back, and the instructors would take me through my recording of that last interrogation. This went on five days a week for like at four months. It was uh, very, very intense. And if you can imagine learning something, you know, by the book and then actually doing it and then watching yourself do it and then other interrogators watching you go through it, just the feedback and the input just made it a phenomenal, you know, incredible training session. There's a final test. Uh, the last interrogation, of course, was brutal. <laughs> uh, so it, it took, it was a lot of stress. But again, um, it helped me in a lot of areas in life. Uh, just understanding people, reading people, and I'll get into more of that here in a bit. Overall, interrogation training, they train us in all facets of intelligence. Uh, there are intelligence analysts, you know, that gather information and review information. There are uh, what you guys know as SIGINT intelligence that, you know, deal with signals, you know, coming out of the NSA. And the Army had its own little group that did that in a tactical fashion if they were actually going into the battlefield. But all that still was fed up to NSA. So we trained in all, all facets of intelligence, counterintelligence and things like that. We were looking at, you know, because we had to prep uh, we had to have this training so we would understand what other information was available to us before I went into an interrogation so I could have all the information I needed to actually prep and learn about what's going on with this particular individual or team or whatever. So it was uh, some really good training. And of course, there was computers. You guys probably heard a lot about interrogators over the last 10 years since 9-11 uh, and Abu Ghraib and Gitmo and all that. Uh, it's changed. The, uh, it's called a military occupational specialty. Many of you may have been in the military. It's an MOS. Uh, when I first came in the Army, it was a 96 Charlie, and they were called interrogators of prisoners of war. But then they, they thought that was too uh, abrasive, I guess, and they turned us into 97 Echoes, and they called us Interrogator Translator. So they kind of a little, you know, a little nicer. <laughs> and then uh, after Abu Ghraib and all the investigations and, you know, senators talking about POWs and what we did, and it was ugly at Abu Ghraib. Uh, and you can imagine if Chris or any other speakers here could tell you that, hey, if you torture your, your target, you're probably going to not get a lot of information out of them. And that's, that's exactly true. So the Abu Ghraib was a horrible incident. So after that, they completely changed it and they removed the name interrogator from the whole thing, and now they're just human intelligence collectors. Uh, the field manuals changed as well. Uh, all of these are available online. It's you know, a really good source for Daesh and ISIS and anybody else to go out there and go, oh, here's, here's the actual interrogation techniques they're going to use on us. Oh, OK. So it's, it's, you can get all this online. It's one way of operating, I guess. <laughs> Once you become an interrogator, sometimes you're involved in a couple different areas. You might be. You might do a tactical interrogation, you know, during a conflict, like the ones that are going on now, or you might be, you know, and that's basically information that's 24 to 48 hours. You're trying to get it right away because something's going on and you want to make sure you get that information right away. 
So you use different approaches and techniques to, to gain that information. The other program uh, you might go into would be called a strategic debriefer. And that would be, you know, let's say someone is trying to immigrate to the United States and, you know, he's coming from Iran and he used to work at the airport in construction and we would ask them, we had a whole different objective for that and we would want to know, well, tell us about, you know, what kind of concrete was used, what was poured. So then we gather that kind of intelligence and we know, well, we know what kind of concrete they use on the airport, so we need this type of bomb to take the airport out. So that would... That'd be the role of a strategic uh, debriefer. And then there was a psychological operation, PSYOPs. Uh, they, they take our skills and they use those to, you know, do a lot of different things. Some things, you know, disinformation to try to throw the enemy off. Uh, the PSYOPs unit would have, they would go into a country and they could set up a TV station, a radio station, a newspaper, and then within 24 hours start broadcasting on the radio and on TV, intercepting a TV signal, sending out propaganda over that signal. And then they could, of course, you've heard of leaflet dropping and things like that. So they could do a lot of that. The uh, area of PSYOPs is, you know, kind of interesting because it's, it's changed too. It doesn't sound like a very friendly name. So that's become a whole new name basically for collecting of information. So it's they're kind of they're trying to make uh, all these roles and tactics appear to be nicer which is not working but <laughs> so i first found out and i said this enticing thing about being an interrogator and all the movies we've watched and all the stuff that you know we used to see and you know i was thinking the bamboo shoots and you know, the rack and, you know, whatever. Never heard of water waterboarding when I was in college, so I had no idea what that was. Walk into the class and there's like six instructors and they come in and the lead instructor comes in and there's 16 of us in class. And he comes in, we have one objective here and that is to teach you how to lie. And imagine having six months of training on how to lie. And you know, that's the whole basis of what many, you know, all social engineering is about. You go in, you're trying to be something, somebody, you're pretexting, you're role-playing, and you're, you're basically lying from the get-go. So there was, that was kind of interesting to me to kind of, you know, understand that now we're going to learn how, how to lie very effectively. Now, this kind of gets into the meat of what I'm talking about because these are the approaches uh, that we would use and we were trained on, you know, for, you know, over and over again, just so we would know how to really uh, understand what is the best approach by reading our source, you know, looking at that body language, you know, looking at, you know, different things, speech patterns and stuff like that. Very similar to what Chris was just talking about. The direct approach is pretty much as it is. I mean, you walk in, I mean, imagine if you have ever imagined if I'm, there, we could have some POWs in here, I don't know. But w if you get caught and you're in a conflict and you're caught by the enemy, imagine the fear that you have, you know, being in that situation. You, you just, it's pretty hard to comprehend. I've never been in that situation. I've been in simulations, but never been in the real thing. And so many, many times, just walking up and doing the direct approach with, you know, they just, they don't care. They just, they're so afraid they're going to give you everything. And it's just, you know, it's, you, you try that approach first and maybe another interrogator tries that approach first. You get whatever information you can or someone resists you and then you go, okay, we're going to try a different approach. Uh, incentive approach, basically, you know, hey, we're going to give you this if you give us this, you know. We'll give you, you know, better sleeping conditions, better food, you know, cleaner water, all that stuff. So incentives to basically bribe them to give us information. Emotional approaches, you know, kind of get, you know, they're a little more uh, interesting because you really have to understand your source and you really have to uh, build a rapport with him or her, uh, and I haven't interrogated many women, but 
men especially, you know, it's a little bit different approach you want to use. You know, you have to adjust to, you know, their culture. You have to adjust to, you know, their, their particular circumstance. You know, you learn about, you know, where they were captured, you know, what they were captured with, what unit they were with, and then you use that to figure out ways to get information out of them. And that's all we want to do, which is the same thing a social engineer does. I want information. How can I get it in the most effective, efficient way? So you can imagine someone comes in and they're really scared uh, out of their wits. And, you know, an emotional love approach, you know, you know really works a lot. Uh, and these positive approaches are probably more conducive to social engineering because, like I said, you know, the negative ones, you know, work in some instances. When, but most of the time it's a positive approach on the social engineering side. So, you know, showing someone, you can imagine... Uh, when you're in a situation that you might be as a POW, just to feel a kind touch, you know, on your shoulder. It just, you know, as opposed to thinking, this guy's gonna beat the crap out of me. Uh, using that approach is very, very effective with, you know, many, many pe uh, people in that, in, in that kind of situation. Uh, historically, a lot of the things we've been dealing with right, right now have been dealt with, you know, very so strong emotional hate. So the, you can use that approach if you have the right uh, follow-up to gain the information. And it's very effective if someone, you know, for some reason decides they're not as afraid as they, we thought they were. And they try to, you know, be a little more uh, upfront about, you know, their feelings about whatever conflict's going on or whatever the situation is. So, it, you know, it, we use that um, lightly when it's necessary because uh, you're not going to get information out of someone, you know, if all they're spewing is hate and, you know, fear out, you know, as you just try to bang down on them hard. And I'm not saying physically, I'm talking emotionally and verbally or it's, you know, a tag team approach where you have several different interrogators uh, going after a source to get the information. Uh, emotional fear up, same thing. Uh, you want to increase the fear. Uh, and there's a variety of ways we would do that. We would, you know, do that through various threats, uh, various intimidation techniques and things like that. But again, all emotional. Uh, you know, this isn't, there's no physical abuse whatsoever in this. I can, I'll get into some of the physical stuff that we were permitted, you know, by whatever law or by training, you know, to do. Because again, you're not, the information, you want accurate information that's timely and, it, you know, fear doesn't necessarily, you know, bring that out of, you know, of a person in, a, in the most accurate way. Uh, emotional fear down, again, is when that we see how scared they are, we know how scared they are, and we're trying to do everything uh, to calm them down and to assure them, you know, that we're not going to hurt them. You know, that we're going to take care of them. We tell them, hey, you, you know, we're going to feed you, clothe you, you know, you're, we're going to get you back to your family as soon as, you know, we can work out you know, whatever process we need to. So, you know, please, you know, calm down. We want to take care of you. Uh, emotional pride, you go up. Basically, you're trying to build somebody up. And this really works well as a social engineer. You know, when you walk in talk to the receptionist and you're, like, complimenting her or, uh, you know, being nice to the security guard because he's a Eagles fan, even though you're a Cowboys fan, even though I'm, I'm a Niners fan. So. so that ego up, you know, social engineers use, you know, all the time. Once in a while, we'll, you know, we'll use uh, ego down where you want to you know, use your so-called pretext and your role playing in a position that, well, listen, yeah, the CEO is expecting me and, you know, that doesn't happen, you know, I'm, you know, I would hate to put in a bad word about you. So those kinds of areas, they work. They're probably not the most effective way, you know, even for social engineers, you know, to utilize that technique, you know, to really put the fear of God in someone or use that authority and somehow to, you know, abuse them in some way. Uh, emotional futility, probably, you know, basically that's where we're, we're telling the source that, you know, you... You know, there is no hope. You know, you are done. 
you're going to be a you know, prisoner of war you know, for a very, very long time. And we just make his position look futile so that basically he or she gives up and says, okay, you know, I, here's what I know. I, there's nothing I can do anyway, so I'm just going to tell you. Other approaches, which a lot of social engineers can use as well, uh, is one, the we know all approach is when you basically are telling your target that, that source, hey, you know, we know your unit, we know you were here, we know you were going after this, and, you know, we already talked to your friends and they already spilled, so, you know, go ahead and tell us because we already know it all anyway. We just, if you cooperate, you know, we'll be kinder to you uh, in, you know, your circumstances here right now. So it's, a, it's an excellent approach uh, because it, again, kind of plays on the futility approach. We already know everything, but, you know, we need to know you cooperate. If you don't, and basically we're writing everything down uh, to record, even though we may not know anything. Uh, file and dossier approach, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of a role playing approach where you walk in, you have a bunch of, you know, papers and stuff and you throw them down on the desk and, you, you know, talking to the source and he's like, oh my gosh, what's all this? And you kind of shuffle through the papers and uh, they're, you know, then you look up, oh yeah, you're in this unit and this is your commander. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry about him uh, getting shot like that. Oh yeah, your other comrade. Yeah, he's wounded in the hospital, but we're taking care of him. Just wanted you to know. And another one, repetition approach. Uh, probably not real effective on social engineering. <laughs> you don't sit there and ask, you know, whoever you're trying to gather information from the same question over and over and over again. Uh, it'll, it'll annoy them. They'll wonder, you know, you know what, what's going on and why you're acting so weird. But in an interrogation situation, it's very applicable. But probably not so in social engineering. But try it. You know, who knows? It might work for you. <laughs> Uh, rapid fire approach is when you have multiple people, and this some, sometimes can't work. If you go, if you have a lot of people that have approach a front desk, it can distract, it can uh, cause you know a lot of confusion for the people at the front desk, and you'd be amazed at you know people that you could sneak around from a social engineering perspective, you know, to get through you know that front gate and that uh, that uh, desk and things like that. So. That rapid fire approach uh, can be effective in a social engineering setting if you plan it properly and execute it properly. But if, you know, imagine a, a source who've just been captured, uh, just basically having three or four people firing questions at him at one point in time, he or she is just going to be confused, dazed, and eventually just wears them down. And that's, you know, part of the goal, uh, wear them down emotionally. Silent approach. Uh, it's, it can be very, very effective uh, in an uh, interrogation perspective. Don't see a lot of applicability here, you know, with uh, social engineering. Uh, you know, you're not going to get a lot of information. You just sit there and be silent, you know, whether you're at the front desk, in the receptionist's office, or on the phone. It's not going to be that effective. You can have those, uh, what they call, you know, pregnant pauses where the, you're making them think and that, that can be effective. But the silent approach here is you just sit across, you know, the interrogation table and you're either not looking at the source for a long, long time or you're looking directly at the source for a very long time, but you're not saying a word. And, of course, their mind's just going crazy with what's going on, what's going to happen. I have no idea what this... Uh, what this person's, what this interrogator is trying to do. Change of scenery uh, is very effective. Uh, you take a person, you know, you still have an, a military police um, and with you, but you say you take them out of the security compound. You walk them over, you know, kind of see, you know, a little different view. It kind of changes their perspective. They get out, they get to just take a walk. They're out of, uh, the, you know, their uh, POW compound. So change of scenery can work, and it can work from a social engineering perspective as well. Um, 
you talking to someone and you come out uh, just you know if you watch spy games but you Robert Redford saying hey always keep a pack of cigarettes a lighter you know because it's an easy way to start a conversation with someone and you know you can walk someone outside while they're going to take a smoke break and begin you know your uh, information there gathering whatever you can you know in a, in a different setting you know they feel less uh, less exposed yeah they're they're more comfortable and you know they don't have any other people around them that might hear what you're talking about you guys have seen some of these uh, the, the mutton Jeff approach or the good cop bad cop you've seen that done the one really someone's you know really being harsh with the uh, source and then someone comes in and breaks that up and says hey you know you can't treat this guy like this and moves in and it, you know they're being the nice cop and you know it you know it's very effective uh, you can use this you can definitely apply this uh, to social engineering in situations where someone is leading in as a part of an overall social engineering exercise and you're the one that kind of redeems and saves you know an individual and you earn you know their uh, respect and their build that rapport with them from you know being the one that rescued them from the bad person uh, false flag the uh, not a lot of applicability in, in some senses I mean you can there it it works uh, you know of course in uh, interrogation settings but not so much in uh, the social engineering I've never applied it in social engineering separation of course you guys have heard of that separation could be a positive thing or a negative thing so in some instances when you know you've heard of putting them in isolation uh, you know that's that's it's very harsh treatment eventually emotionally you know we we love human interaction it's a natural thing if you don't have that you know it really wears you down emotionally um, Physical separation is a part of that, and then uh, field expedient separation uh, is a is another drastic technique that you know we you know we, we would apply you know in certain circumstances as well. Separation you know is a social engineering you know technique you can definitely use whether you're in whatever setting in the business setting or if you're actually approaching someone that you've already done research on and you know where they're doing their happy hour and you make your approach then to initially you know gain uh, familiarity and rapport you know with the source of information and gain more information about their colleagues but kind of separating them so if you're asking intrusion intruding questions or maybe you know corporate sensitive questions you know they'd be more uh, inclined to provide that information for you. That there's a lot of things they taught us during that six month uh, training. That was a series of various questioning skills. Uh, and again, we do those three hour labs. We'd ask certain questions. They'd come back and say, "You should have, you know, used this question. You should have tried this technique." And you know we'd have direct questions, indirect questions, closed questions, open questions, leading questions, and then uh, something a lot of social engineers should you know take advantage of control questions, verifying the information that someone may have told you. They may have told you something and you think it's correct, but they may have misspoke, forgot, and then oh suddenly as you keep talking it comes back uh, to them and. So a control question is always a good thing to v verify and validate information. Listening, of course, is paramount. You have to you have to listen to what your source is saying and the, the inflection of their voice. And this is the same thing, you know, in social engineering. I'm you know I'm more adept at person-to-person uh, -person social engineering. I haven't practiced. I, you know, I'm decent at phone, but I'm not. I'm not as good as some of these guys uh, by any means. I just haven't done it enough because I like that contact. I like to see them. I like to, I like to know and understand where they're coming from, when they feel uncomfortable, when I'm making them feel good. It's easier for me. I'm, I'm decent, but not as good as these guys. I just don't have enough practice. Uh, but these are different type of listening techniques, dialogic, critical, uh, emotional. And then 
the biggest thing that they beat into us in school is attention to detail, the littlest detail. And you'd be in a situation, and these have, they have these scenarios that they've been going through for years and years and years, and they know there's just one piece of voice inflection or one movement, you know, of, you know, uh, a facial uh, movement. And, you know, if I didn't catch that, they'd tell me, like, you missed that. If you'd have gone that, then the role, he would have gone in this, in, uh, this other direction, and I would have had the information faster. Sometimes you go back and, you know, I get the information, but they were like, yeah, you should have, you should have been done in, you know, an hour and a half. And you, you, you went almost, you know, two and a half hours because you missed this one clue. And then covers. Uh, covers are just one of the easiest ways, you know, to gain information. Uh, many times, you know, I wouldn't, we'd, I wouldn't walk in you know, to the PW compound or the interrogation booth, I would, you know, as an entire, your interrogator, how are you? I would come in as someone else. Uh, I might come in as the UN. I might come in as, you know, another, uh, you know, as Humana, a humanitarian organization and say, hi, I'm with the uh, United Nations and we're investigating, you know, uh, the treatment of POWs here in this situation. I want to find out what's going on. So if you would please tell me about yourself, and that and I, they would be like, I said, I got, I can help you out, and then I'm, we're going to get you out of here. Of course, I'm lying my ass off, uh, but you know, I'm the UN guy, and that's what they think. So we play a lot of different roles: priests, doctors, a lot of things, and just basically lie to them to gain that, you know, get the information out of them because they don't think I'm an interrogator; they think I'm someone else trying to help them out. Of course, props, costumes for all those roles we would use. Uh, stress positions. You guys probably heard about these a little bit in the news. Uh, we would do this once in a while. The ones we would apply, uh, so I've worked a lot in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so just putting someone outside in the sun and having them stand in a certain position for, you'd be amazed you know, if you put someone in a certain position, just how tired their legs get, and they just start wobbling, and they're in the hot sun, and then you bring them, you know, the most, you know, we would do, usually, it wouldn't take long, because, you know, it's 120 degrees out there, uh, we'd be like 15 minutes, and then we, you know, because we didn't want any heat, heat we didn't want anything to die, okay, you're not going to get information out of a dead person, so we didn't want anyone to die. So if you see kind of the correlation, I'm you know, hoping you're seeing you know, the, what I saw seven, eight years ago as I saw this as a potential threat to the companies that I consulted with. You know, there's objectives for both match and that they're trying to obtain information. Techniques match, you know, there's lying, there's deception. Besides being you know, attention to detail, planning in us, being sincere and convincing, which is exactly what a social engineer does. Like Chris is saying, you know, he, don't ever go out of pretext. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Just, hey, this is, what, this is what I am, this is my role, this is, my, this is uh, what I'm trying to do here, and you know, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, and training you to be sincere and convincing was you know, one of the most important uh, rules that they made us abide by. We wanna build rapport with whoever we're trying to get information from. We want them to have confidence in us. And so we, you know, that was, there's complete overlap there with social engineering and interrogation techniques. A lot of the methods overlap, a lot of the approaches overlap. So that was kind of the whole gist of, you know, why I, want, why I wanted to come here and share with you and hopefully get feedback and input on what you, what you think about how the Army trained me as an interrogator which is a little bit different than uh, how they're training today, but still pretty much everything the same. Uh, lying, big deception, building rapport, questioning techniques and style, reading your source or target's body language, attitudes, emotions, you know, kind of having that sixth sense, pretexting, cover stories, all are things that you know, overlap between social engineering and interrogation. 
Uh, yeah, lying. You know, it's, it's you know, I've, I've, I guess, first raised, I was, I'm, or, I'm an ordained Mormon priest. I'm an ironic priest, according to the Mormon church. But I left them when I was 13, and, but still had, you know, some, you know, Judeo-Christian, you know, faith and background. So lying really wasn't something that was very conducive to the way I was raised. But I learned, I learned to adapt to it uh, very quickly. But sometimes it, it really got the best because I'd be dating someone and I'd just, I'd go into cover and pretext and I'd be like, holy shit, I just lied the crap out. <laughs> then I'd have to go back and, you know, cover myself later if the relationship turned into anything long term. <laughs> so it, uh, it, uh, it's very interesting ab about lying, but it's just something that's at the heart of social engineering uh, and what we, you know, what, what we need to do in order to get the information from people. Building rapport is critical. Uh, whether you're lying or not, you're just trying to build rapport. And you, once you gain that confidence, once you get that, the faster you get that rapport, the faster you'll get the information. Uh, and you do whatever you need to do. One of the situations I was in when I was uh, conducting uh, a pen test for an organization, CEOs, of course, are very susceptible. They're getting better, but you know, senior executives they seem to think that they don't have to follow the security policies and, and IT security rules and things like that. Uh, so we conducted a test. We went after the CEO. Uh, we did initial research, found out you know, what he was going to be doing, where he was going to be. Uh, we knew he was going to be out of the office for a certain period of time. And so we planned this uh, over about two weeks. Uh, when he was not in the office, we'd call his receptionist and we basically started posing as his new father-in-law to be, whom she had never met. And, you know, he was all, he was completely busy with work, had no idea about what was going on with the, all, all the wedding plans. And basically went after the receptionist because we had heard in other engagements at uh, some of the really swanky uh, clubs in Washington, D.C., uh, that, you know, because he was a CEO, really had a bad memory problem, wrote down all his passwords. And one of the IT guys that we basically uh, listened to, you know, in a surreptitious way, as I might say, basically said, oh, yeah, it keeps him here in his desk. He goes, and I, I've told him 10 times, if I've told him 20. So <laughs> I walk in. I've called her up. I'm saying, hey, I know he's going to be back. I'm coming by the office uh, to meet uh, your CEO. And, you know, I'm such and such. Uh, he's uh, marrying, you know, my son. Oh, great. So she's like, of course, all a flutter. And she goes, well, let me know when you get here. Okay. And, you know, I'll just walk you right up. You know, he is. That'll be great. Just I'll let you know when I'm in the reception. She was down there waiting for me in reception. Took the security and goes, I'm, he's going to see CEO. Oh, okay. Walk right past security. You know, of course, we were checking driver's licenses and all that stuff. She's just all about everything. So I'm kind of waiting about five minutes in a chair next to her. And I see she's busy and I kind of look like I'm a little bored and, you know, kind of flustered. I know he's not coming back for another hour and a half. She finally goes, would you like to wait in his office? He was like, yes. Oh, that would be awesome. Then I don't want to disturb you anymore. So I get in the office. She leaves me in there all by myself, walk over the desk, take a picture of uh, the information of all the passwords, and then uh, proceed to log in as him on his computer to download a couple of pieces of information, you know, as evidence that, you know, we breached them. I really felt bad when he did the after action because she felt horrible. All she could think of was how excited, you know, she was going to meet the new father-in-law and this big wedding's coming. And of course, you know, the mom is doing all these wedding plans and stuff like that. Uh, and she's just, you know, trying to help her out with his schedule and just would love me walking in there and getting a chance to meet me. And, you know, again, lying, 
kind of something, you know, if you have a conscience, sometimes you kind of feel bad afterwards. But again, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I really feel, she would, seriously, she was just so excited to bring me up. And it was like, she just walked me right into his office. So uh, building rapport, you know, was really important. And being sincere and convincing. Of course, you see, you, you all understand, you know, the pretexting portions of this, uh, developing, you know, a scenario, doing your planning and prep and your recon, you know, using as much open source information as you can, or using other steps to target people in order to accomplish what your overall goal is. We use the same techniques uh, as interrogators, just, you know, it's a little bit uh, different. We're looking at personality types just as you are. We're looking at emotional states of mind. And, you know, we, baiting also is a classic technique that, you know, you're all aware of uh, as a social engineer. I, we've covered this. Uh, there's some differences, of course, you know, are the target for social engineer, you know, isn't in a POW compound and isn't being forced to give information. So they're not held against their will. They're not under a major emotional dis duress. And the source actually may have training, you know, on resistance techniques. So it's a little bit different. Most targets for social engineers, most of them, which goes back to the whole purpose of this, is the education of this on how to resist these types of things. Let me get here. Uh, so we're promoting big time cyber seer program, social engineering resistance and evasion, which basically deal with security policy enforcement, awareness training, building, S, building social engineering uh, defense in your business architecture, in your security architecture, and then testing it. You know, it's all great if you do this education, but if you don't test it, you can't confirm and validate that the learning is actually taking place. I had the concluding thoughts, things I've already said, so let's jump to questions because I was flagged on 10 minutes to go. Any questions? No operational questions, please, about anything like that. Go ahead, sir. How do, um, how do some of the military trainings differ from some of the civil uh, law enforcement-like inter uh, interrogation, like the, some of the read techniques and some of the right, yeah. implement, you know, There's a lot of, varied implementation? A lot of the approaches still work, you know, Mutt and Jeff, right. uh, bad cop, good cop, emotional up and down, fear up, fear down, you know, so law enforcement will use a lot of those same techniques. Um, you know, of course, they're, they have, you know, if you're in the United States, you have rights. If you're in Morocco and you're, you know, it's completely different law enforcement style. So, but yeah, there's, very, there's a lot of similarities. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Either one? Does it work? There you yes. go. Yeah. So how do you, how can you tell if your subject uh, is holding back information or legitimately doesn't know anything? Yeah, that, that's always, you know, that's always something you need to validate. Uh, so you might use different approaches with different interrogators, put them in a situation that they definitely won't, don't want to be in for very long and then change the approach, you know, maybe do a fear, fear up approach with one interrogator, really scare, you know, the bejesus out of him and then you know bring someone else in to comfort him and then you know you, you can learn I mean, again body language is, is critical I mean you you know they can try the silent treatment on you but it's one rule you guys should ever know you cannot not be broken everyone breaks and I learned that from uh, some Israelis that were actually interrogated by the Russians and they said, we broke, you know, we were trained well, we were, you know, and I'm trained well, you know, we, we broke. Um, so eventually, you know, we're gonna get the information. Sir? 
Hi. Um, so you mentioned uh, interrogators' roles as input into psychological operations. I yes. think the new PR term is strategic communication. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not quite that. But okay. It's something, yeah, it's pretty much information. It's something information, and I forgot to look it up. Um, I was wondering if you could give uh, examples of what it looks um, like to do that at scale or what sort of um, information you would give or what sort of uh, input you'd give to those kind of uh, at scale. Yeah, so like on the positive um, side, like when we were in uh, – Mogadishu, we try to go in there and be the nice people. Of course, we're bringing food and doing all this stuff. Uh, one of the things we did was we, we write cool little Arabic phrases, you know, on fans uh, that they could use to basically keep the flies off themselves and keep themselves cool. So Sorry, man, as, a, as an interrogator, what kind of input would an interrogator yeah, have? Yeah, I would basically have, knowing the culture, having the training, I, see. Uh, I would tell them this, this, this is what works on a positive way. This does not work on a negative way. So they might do an, a really harsh campaign, drop a bunch of leaflets, do some serious radio broadcasting all over a place, telling them, hey, turn in your weapons or we're going to do this. And so that if that's might, compelling to that specific type of, uh, of target yeah, or culture. It just depends. Yeah, sometimes they would do nice things. Thanks. One of the missions I did was that uh, after Hurricane Andrews, because it obliterated everything. And so they uh, sent me down there with a team, and we stood up a TV station, a radio station, and started printing out where all the water points are, where all the medical points were, and stuff like that. So good and bad use for psychops. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, this question is in regards to uh, role-playing and uh, maintaining a backstop in your cover. Yeah. Uh, like when you're, like you mentioned, um, when you're taking yeah, it exactly. that far away from the truth as posing as the target's father-in-law. Uh, oh yeah, the lid's gonna be blown the second the guy comes back into work. How, oh yeah, no. How do you work, how do you sort of uh, are you considering that when you're building that backstory? Uh, always on on that, but our approach there was to be in and out before he was ever there, and then come back and report to him, hey, you were breached, and guess what, you were the because yeah. that's were the basically veteran. that's that's a short game. That's not like a... well, we had done a, a a lot of work ahead of time, and if we. If we didn't have someone actually watching exactly what meeting he was in at that point point in time, uh, and then signaling me, hey, he's coming in, you know, then I would excuse myself. But we knew he was in a meeting for at least two more hours, and I had basically I was, my target was to be in his office within 30 minutes or less, and I got in within uh, 15. So you didn't have like a backstop there. Sort of uh, no, not her. not not in that scenario. I would I would have just said, "What do you?" If she would have recognized something, uh, you know, it would, I had her. I already had her, you know, hook, line, and sinker when she escorted me up to the office. So I knew if I couldn't get to the office, if security stopped me at the gate, this is one thing too. If your security policy, you know, I go and I show a business card, like we were saying, that's that's not good enough. All right, I show a license, you know, government ID, you know, okay, that's that's decent, but I can call Ross up, up at, you know, and he can get me a fake license, so I can use that. If you uh, go to a state agency, they're going to write down the information. So if I go to the state of New York and walk into one of their IT groups, that security guard is not letting me leave until he writes down all my information. But I could still be wrong. He's just writing it down. If you go to a federal installation, they take your license. If it's fake, they're scanning it. They're looking, oh, this guy's from Idaho. Okay, well, guess what? No, this, is, this license isn't valid. So the level of security, of course, that costs a lot to scan every state and for every government ID yeah. possible. So if the security guard were to stop me, that was where, you know, I had, you know, my, my backstop yeah. to, you know, exfiltrate. All right, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Were there any materials, specifically like books or sources we could read that would be readily available to civilians that really helped you become a better interrogator and social engineer? Uh, there's, I can, I can send those uh, with Chris's permission, you know, over to his website. The links to the PDFs on all the Army field, ma field manuals that they've been using over the last 15, 20 years. Okay. So I can get that if. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yes, sir. All your experience and thank you for your service. Thank you. What would you say is your biggest weakness? <coughs> Don't answer that in death time. Don't answer that. Don't do it. Uh, carrot 
Thank you guys so much. So did you have a question? Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, sir. Right. What would you say would be the most common reaction you get from people when they figure out when they kind of start to figure out or give information? Well, normally because uh, you need to understand what they know going into a situation like that and what they don't. Suspi you know, suspicion you know can be raised, and you know if if something bringing up what he said, if something with the receptionist waiting in waiting by her desk came up. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, I see signs from other people that look suspicious to me. You know, there's always, hey, where's your restroom? I go skip the restroom, hit direct, you know, head to the elevator and get out of there. Yes, sir. As a from as a social engineer, or as an interrogator. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah, well, yeah, it does. yeah. It does. The <laughs> techniques. But, but if, I have had a lot of ex-girlfriends that have said, "Dude, I didn't know you were like that, but there was something weird about you because you had these like you knew you knew what I was going to do, and you asked questions, and then you asked follow-up questions, and it was like." I don't know how you figured that out. I'm like, yeah, well, it's just oh, it's six cents. Did you question your own sincerity Oh, I used to after I got out when I was when I was much younger. Uh, definitely. So I mean, I just, I seriously, I'd go into a pretext. I'd be lying to, you know, my parents, you know, and you know, girlfriends or whoever because that was the training. It becomes easy, right? Oh yeah, no, the role playing just yeah, the lying was very. It took me. Uh, took me a couple hard lessons to learn, you know, the importance of truth. And you want great information, and you want it to be true. So you got you have to respect the truth, and you have to know why you're lying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent job.